Uh, keep your copy of the Word of God close by, maybe something to uh, make some notes on tonight. We are continuing on in our study that's called Back to the Basics. And what that has meant for us over the course of these past few months is that we have been going through what is our Baptist faith and message. And the Baptist faith and message is the Southern Baptist doctrinal statement originally penned in 1925 by a guy named E.Y. Mullins, uh, updated heavily under the hand of another great Southern Baptist pastor named Herschel Hobbs. And then in the year 2000, men of God like Paige Patterson and Adrian Rogers and others came together and then said, okay, let's make sure that our doctrinal statement reflects not only the Word of God, but our commitment to reaching this culture for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have before us here tonight that great doctrinal statement. Tonight we're going to be looking at article number nine. And article number nine has to do with the kingdom of God. Now to set that up to give us some understanding, think about the kingdoms of this world. I don't know if you had to guess, how many countries would you say there are in the world today? You ever think about things like that? There are 195 countries in the world today, or what we would call countries. This total comprises 193 countries that are member states of the United States and two countries that are non-member observer states, that is the Holy See, of course the Roman Catholic Church, and then the state of Palestine. I won't even get into that subject tonight. You can go find my teaching on that in another place. But in those countries, you have many different types of governments. You have in some places a direct democracy. You have a representative democracy. We hear a lot lately about socialism and about communism. Uh, in other places, old world environments, you have a monarchy. Or in some places, you have what's called an oligarchy. That is to say, ruled by a handful of wealthy people coming together to set the agenda for the nation and some other places, an autocracy. All different kinds of forms of government in these countries. Now, as you look at the individual leaders of those countries in those particular governments, we know that we have presidents, we have prime ministers, we have kings and queens. Uh, some more German-speaking countries, they have chancellors. Now, when you think about those leaders, some of them gain the control of their kingdoms by an election of the people in more democratic areas and countries. But some of those leaders took their kingdoms by force, by military force, or by a conspiracy or coup or some other way. We know that some kingdoms are prosperous and many other kingdoms, third world countries we think about, are very poor. But Scripture is clear that there will still be many kingdoms on this planet at the end of time. There will be a variety of kingdoms all over the world and that at the end of time, when you read the Revelation, what we find out is that those kingdoms, those remaining kingdoms, especially in the east, are going to come together. They are going to join, join forces to come to battle against the people of God and against our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, they're not going to win. Read it for yourself in Revelation 19. In a world that is filled with kingdoms, we do well to remember that there is one king who reigns above all the kings. And so the Bible says right there in Revelation 19 that our Savior Jesus is King of kings and He is Lord of lords. His name is Jesus and tonight we are going to celebrate the kingdom of our Savior Jesus. So with that being said tonight, let me read to you what Article 9 of the Baptist Faith and Message says says the kingdom of God includes both His general sovereignty over the universe and His particular kingship over men who willfully acknowledge Him as king and praise the Lord, many do. Particularly, the kingdom is the realm of salvation into which men enter by trustful, childlike commitment to Jesus Christ. Christians ought to pray and to labor that the kingdom may come and God's will be done on the earth. The full consummation of the kingdom awaits the return of Jesus Christ and the end of the age. So many aspects of this tonight, so many phases and dynamics of the kingdom that we could look at. We want to try and unpack some of those just for a few minutes this evening. 
So we know that there are multiple meanings to the phrase kingdom of God. The context in which that phrase is used often determines exactly what it is the the writer of Scripture was talking about or the pastor might be talking about. The most obvious understanding is that the kingdom of God includes His general sovereignty over the universe. In other words, we are saying, we're beginning with the foundation that God is in absolute complete control. Let me say that one more time. Our God right now, today, and forever is in absolute, complete control. In case you wondered if that's true or not, the sovereignty of God is plastered all over the pages of Scripture. From Genesis all the way to the Revelation, you cannot escape the sovereignty of God. In fact, when the um, original early church uh, uh, councils were coming together, and they were trying to determine what we now know as the canon of Scripture. If you want to know more about that, you can go back and look back in this study, back to the basics, and article number one was about revelation, about the Scripture, so you can see there what we said about that. But as they were beginning to determine, okay, which, which books of, that we have here available to us are part of the canon of Scripture, one of the books that was contested was the book of Esther, I'm going to say something maybe you've never heard before, but go read it and find out for yourself. Do you know that the name of God is never mentioned in the book of Esther? God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. You say, well, then why should it be included in the pages of Scripture? Well, have you read the book? Even though His name is not mentioned, God is all over the book of Esther. Because he is sovereign, and in his sovereignty, he works providentially through Esther and Mordecai and others to begin to salvage the people of God. All I'm saying is that sometimes, maybe even when we don't think or don't know that God is in control, he's actually in complete control and working all things together for his own glory. Let me give you just a little small smattering of passages in the Scripture that talk about the sovereignty of God. One of these I love is Psalm 115, verse 3. Psalm 115, verse 3 says this, Our God is in heaven. Amen, aren't you glad? And by the way, remember in the New Testament, when when Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, he said he had a revelation and he was caught up into the third heaven. You ever wondered what that is? You know, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, but most evangelicals, most commentators agree that our horizon is probably what we as human beings would consider to be our first heaven. But then you get beyond our horizon, beyond our atmosphere, you come out to the universe, that comprises the second heaven, all the expanse of space and all those heavenly bodies. But then you step beyond the second heaven and you come into the third heaven. The third heaven is beyond the realm of space and time and matter. And that's the place of God. And how amazing and awesome that is. So the Bible says, our God is in heaven. And He does whatever He pleases. In other words, nobody tells God what to do. Because in fact, He is God. And He has no limitations whatsoever. He is in absolute sovereign control. This passage I love as well from 1 Chronicles 29... Verses 11 through 12, if you want these notes, you can find them available in the app. They're there for you to see. But here's what the Bible says in 1 Chronicles 29. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over everything. In your hand is power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. All sovereign majesty, power, glory belongs to God. And that I love this one. Would we think about our God being king of kings? Think about this. Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, He turns it wherever He wishes. You know, God did this with Pharaoh. If you go back and read the account of the Exodus, 
In one, in one case, God turned Pharaoh's heart to release the children of Israel. God turned his heart to bring out deliverance for his own people, Israel. But then in a very next episode, he hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Why did God do that? Because he's in absolute sovereign control over all the kings of this earth. Now we know the kings of this earth, many of them are lost. Many of them do not care about the things of God. Many of them are not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that does not mean that just because they don't acknowledge God as king, that he's no longer sovereign over them. God has the power, all power, to turn the heart of a leader, of a king, of anybody exactly wherever he wants it to go. And so I know that sometimes we have leaders that do love God and they honor the Lord and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we have leaders who don't stand for righteousness. You know what we ought to pray? We ought to pray, God, you have the power to let this wicked person be saved and to turn their heart to righteousness for our country, for our state, for our city. We ought to pray that way because God's in complete control. And then, of course, we know. How many of y'all know we're coming up to Christmas time? You like to listen to Handel's Messiah, the Hallelujah Chorus? Where does that all come from? Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Did he make that up? No. He found that in Revelation 19, verse 6. So it says about Jesus, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. He has all power. He's in absolute, complete control. Now, skeptics sometimes say that there is no God. You've heard people say this before. Because if there was a God, there would be much less hate and chaos and violence and crime and evil. So basically, sometimes you've had people in your circle of influence who will question the existence of God and question the sovereignty of God. You and I need to understand that while God is sovereign, that He has allowed the devil to have much power and to have much influence on this earth. You say, well, how? Well, how about through temptation? How about by misleading and lying to people? How about by attempting to destroy people's lives? You say, why in the world would God permit the devil to do that sort of thing? Well, it's all part of God's master plan. See, God intended in His own sovereignty, in His own wisdom, God desired to create a world where not only His sovereignty is in full force, and it is, as we've already clearly demonstrated, but where human beings also have free will. The presence of the devil in this world means that you and I have free will, either to serve God, to please Him, to give our lives to Christ, or to keep our lives for ourselves and to serve ourselves and to listen to the voice of the devil. It is all a part of God's sovereign master plan. Let me say it like this. In the scripture, the devil is called in John 14, the ruler of this world. He said, well, preacher, you just told us that God was sovereign. I thought he's the ruler of the world. Well, yes, ultimately, our God is the ruler over everything. Every world, every age. God's the ruler over all of that. But what the scripture is saying here is that our God has permitted the devil to be the ruler of this age, of this world. The Bible also says about him in Ephesians chapter 2 that he is the prince of the power of the air. So he is a ruler, he's a prince, the Bible says, our adversary the devil. We know that he is currently dominating the landscape of this modern age. I mean, just take a look around. See what's happened to our culture. See what's happening all over the world. Sometimes we read the headlines. We see things happening around us. Do you ever find yourself saying, how has it come to this? How have we got to this point? It's because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that the God of this age is blinding many minds so that people don't even begin to understand what they're doing. Sometimes they don't care or they don't understand the difference between right and wrong because they have not as of yet given their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so sometimes we say, how in the world can this continue to, to happen? How does all this work together? Well, here's what I want to say about that. The devil is, in fact, 
the ruler of this age, the Bible says. He is the, the prince of the power of the air, the powers of darkness. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6 that our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and forces of wickedness in heavenly places. All that is absolutely true. And the evidence of that is manifest all over our world. You see it every day. But you and I do not need to lose heart because here's the truth. Our God is still in control. That's why the devil, if you remember, when you go back and read the first chapters of the book of Job, everything that Job went through, everything that was precious to him except his wife was taken away. And then she said, you just need to go ahead and curse God and die. Well, that's a real blessing. Thank you for that. And then, of course, it wasn't long after that until the devil said to the Lord when Job said, Hey, look, naked, I came into this world. Naked, I'm going to depart. The Lord has given. The Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. And so the devil, through his scheming and conniving, could not get Job to dismiss his faith in God. Could not get him to renounce his faith in God. And so Satan, what does he have to do? He does this twice, right? He crawls back into the presence of God. And says, Lord, of course he's not going to curse you. You haven't let me touch his body yet. And so the Lord actually permitted, remember our adversary, the devil, to touch the body of Job in order that his faith in God might be tested. And guess what? When you read the book of Job, you find out that his faith was strong and that he passed the test. Because he says some iconic words in Job chapter 13. He says about the Lord, he says, even if he slays me, even if he kills me, I'm going to trust him. Because my God is sovereign. My God is king. He's in absolute, complete control. Remember the Bible says about Abraham in, in Hebrews chapter 11 that he was willing to sacrifice his only son Isaac because he thought it was the will of God. And here's what the Bible says about Abraham. He believed that God was able to raise his son from the dead. So Abraham thought to himself... If God wants me to take the life of my only son, I'm going to be obedient to God because my God, if he has decreed this, has a way for my son Isaac, the son of promise, to be raised from the dead. We're talking about the faith of great men of God, Abraham and Job. All I'm saying to you about that is in the situation of Job, the devil could not even touch the body of Job until he had been given permission by God to do it. Our God is sovereign even over the affairs of the devil. We know the activity of the devil is not pleasing to God, but God permits it at this time and he's sovereign over all of that. He has providence over all of that. Now beyond his general sovereignty over all creation, God's kingdom includes his particular kingship over men, over women who willfully acknowledge him as king. That is to say, every child of God has taken their place in the kingdom of God because the Lord rules and reigns in our hearts once we have placed our faith in Jesus. It's not just enough to know Jesus as a historic figure. It's to know Christ as Savior. And if you know Christ as Savior, then you know Him as the Lord, the Master, the King of your life you've entered into the kingdom of God in that point, in this understanding of the kingdom of God. So let me read to you that other part of the article that has to do with the point I'm making right now. The article said, particularly the kingdom is the realm of salvation into which men enter by trustful, childlike commitment to Jesus Christ. So this second understanding of the kingdom of God I want to talk to you about tonight. The first was His general sovereignty over everything. The second is the realm of salvation. How does someone take their place in the kingdom of God? Well, it's like you did. If you're a follower of Jesus, as the article says here, I think it's beautifully written, says through trustful, childlike commitment to Jesus Christ. The only thing you have to do to be born into the kingdom of God is place your faith in Jesus as unto like a little child. You think about this. You know, my mom's here tonight, my mom and dad, when I was young, if they would say to us, hey, let's go load up, let's get in the car, let's go get something to eat or whatever it was we were going to do down to the Kmarts. You remember going to the Kmarts? Our Kmarts we used to go to is now a collision center. We can't go there anymore. But if we were going somewhere, 
And mom and dad said, hey, let's go somewhere. You know what? We didn't go run and hide from them. You know why? We trusted them. We believed them. With the faith of a child. See, children trust their parents. That's why we ought to be men and women of integrity. <laughs> Our kids are looking to us and they trust us. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, it'd be better if a millstone was tied around a man's neck and he was drowned in the depths of the sea than to mislead a little child. Because our children are willing to trust us, they believe us. When you hear the gospel, when you're confronted with your sin, when you're confronted with the truth about Jesus, the only thing you must do to be saved is place your complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ, just like a little child. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to try and pay God, pay God off somehow. You don't have to try and make a deal, a bargain with God. The only thing you must do is by faith receive the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sins. And through childlike faith, you and I are born again and we are ushered into the kingdom of God. That's how it works. That is the gospel. Once a person has placed their faith in Christ... It's then that God becomes their father. We know Jesus becomes our savior. And as we often say, the Holy Spirit becomes our helper. So how does this work for us who are now part of God's kingdom? Well, it means that for the rest of our lives, we seek to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it like this. If you're born again, Jesus is your king. Jesus is your master. You are inhabited by the Holy Spirit. That means that now, for the rest of your life, it is your desire, it is your purpose and your goal to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit because you're now subject to the authority of God. And we're all subject. We know every person is subject to the authority of God, but through faith in Christ, we've said we want a relationship with Jesus. And by virtue of that, we are subject to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So let me read it to you. It's like this. I love this passage from... When I guess I was in college, I read this passage for the first time and it really jumped off at me. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. This is God talking about Israel coming back to Jerusalem, coming back to their land. They're, they're going to be judged by God, but God in His mercy and grace is going to bring them back. And He's talking about the blessing of what it will be like in that day. So I know this is written to the Jewish people in a particular time, but I think it has a Holy Spirit application to us. Isaiah 30, verse 21. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. Every born again believer in Jesus Christ is subject to the King of Kings. So what that means is we are now inhabited by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit speaks to us and directs us. How does the Holy Spirit do that? Well, He guides us not just by His indwelling presence. Sometimes you'll feel a prompting and a leading of the Holy Spirit. He could give you a vision or a dream. There's a multitude of ways that God could speak to us just by the indwelling presence of the Spirit. But we know also that the Holy Spirit often, usually in my life, guides me through the power of the Word of God. Think about that. The same Holy Spirit who has taken habitation inside of you because of your faith in Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that is the author of the Word of God. And the last time I checked, the Bible says, Jesus Christ, our God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Holy Spirit of God has never changed. And the reason the Holy Spirit's never changed is because He's perfect. How can you change on perfection? He's sinless, He's perfect in all of His ways. And so the same God that inhabits you will direct you to His Word and will guide you by His Word. And so then as servants of the Most High God, it is our duty and it's our privilege, by the way, to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Name for me any other religion on this planet that says you can be inhabited by God Himself and be directed by the voice of the Holy Spirit. Name for me any other religion that, that says that, that offers that. See, man, don't, man doesn't contrive anything like that because, see, that, that, that would be something that's beyond man-centered. That's a God thing. That's truth. That's the Holy Spirit's leadership in our life. It's our duty. It's our privilege to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. 
That's, that's being a kingdom citizen. The rest of the article says, Christians ought to pray and to labor that the kingdom may come and that God's will be done on earth. Do those words sound familiar? They ought to because they're taken from the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 because there in that passage, remember, Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That said, we need to put some feet on our prayers, right? First of all, Christians, the Bible, the, the article says here, ought to pray for the coming of the kingdom. Now, in this particular sense, I think we're t- t- still talking about the realm of salvation, about the perfect will of God for this world. So in this sense, I think that what that means is we ought to pray for God's kingdom agenda to be executed, to be established on this earth, rather than the satanic agenda of our adversary, the devil. And what seems to be winning out right now, by the way? It seems to be the satanic agenda of our adversary, the devil. That's what seems to be winning. But Jesus told us to pray against that, didn't he? He said that we should pray daily for God's perfect will to be done in the lives of everybody around us. So that is to say for your spouse, for your children, for your parents, for your siblings, for your friends, for your co-workers, for government leaders, for presidents and for senators and congressmen and mayors and those whom God has raised up and appointed to be decision makers on our behalf. We ought to be praying for them that through them they would have wisdom that they would seek the face of God and that the kingdom of God would be established in them and then be established through them to the rest of the world. It's kind of like this. As I was thinking about it earlier, God laid on my mind Psalm 122, verse 6. I think it's an important verse, not just for the Jews, but for us as Gentiles as well. Psalm 122, verse 6 says that we ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Amen? We believe that God Himself created the nation of Israel. God loves all people, but He created a special people for Himself. He created a city in which the Jews say that God put His name. He put His own name down on the city, they teach. If you ever look, if you were to take a topographical look at the city of Jerusalem overhead, some of y'all have been there with me to Jerusalem, you know there are three valleys that run through Jerusalem. There's the Hinnom Valley, there's the Tyropian Valley, and then there's the Kidron Valley. And if you look at those valleys of Jerusalem overhead, just a topographical look down on Jerusalem overhead, it looks like, it's hard for me to do with my three little fingers here, but it looks like the shin from the Hebrew language. It's, It's one of their letters, one of their consonants. They call it the shin... And Shin is the first letter in the name of God, one of the names of God, which is Shaddai. That is to say, Lord and Master. And so the Jews say, man, Jerusalem is the place where God even impressed His own name down on the city. Now, I don't know about all of that, but I do know that the Word of God says that we have been commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So what we're praying for is that God's people would dwell in peace that they would come to know Jesus as their Messiah because Jesus, the Bible says, is the Prince of Peace. So when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I believe ultimately that we're praying that God's people would come to peace as they place their faith in Jesus Christ. We ought to also, just like we're commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we Gentiles, God's people, we should pray for God's agenda to be accomplished in every part of our world praying for righteousness righteousness to be exalted. And then, of course, the article says here that we ought to labor that the kingdom may come and that God's will would be done. So as we've already said, we pray for God's kingdom in the prayer closet. And I hope that's something we're doing consistently, regularly. We're spending time alone with God. We're praying for God's will to be accomplished on this earth, even as it's done in heaven like Jesus taught us to pray. But then once we get up and leave that prayer closet, then we have been called by God to live out God's kingdom agenda in the world. 
We pray for it in the prayer closet and then privately and then publicly we go out and we live as kingdom citizens according to the will of God. Now to do anything less than that would be called hypocrisy. And in fact, a lot of people are confused about what it means to be a Christian. A lot of people are confused about what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God because perhaps for a long time they've had people around them who said that they were followers of Jesus, who talked a good game, who maybe threw out in their, in their vernacular, in their language, a kingdom agenda. But then as they began to live their lives upon a closer examination, it was obvious that these people were not a part, perhaps, of the kingdom of God. And so what happens is that sometimes through our hypocrisy, we say one thing, then we go and do something else. We actually sometimes are like roadblocks in the midst of God's kingdom work being accomplished in our world. So Jesus really did teach us to pray that God's will would be done, that His kingdom would come, that those things would be done on this earth as they're done in heaven. The last thing I think you and I as followers of Christ want to do is be a roadblock to God's kingdom agenda. We need to get on board with the Lord. We need to make sure we're spending time in prayer and loving God and drawing near to Him and then living consistently, living out what we believe, avoiding hypocrisy because it sends such a confusing message to the world. And then finally, let me close with these final words of the article. This is the third aspect of the kingdom of God. We said the first was the general sovereignty of God. We said the second... It's His reign in the hearts of those that are born again. And then the third aspect is the one that we're looking forward to right now. It is the kingdom of Christ coming at the end of time. The article says here that the full consummation, the summing up of the kingdom awaits, the return of Jesus Christ and the end of of the age. It is the kingdom that Jesus is going to establish when he comes back on this earth at the end of time. And Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on this earth, I believe, right there in Jerusalem. The Bible says, the Revelation says this, Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Now, let me remind you, let me give you the timeline of Revelation. Revelation tells us that the Antichrist is going to come. And when the Antichrist is going to come, that there will be a period of tribulation on this earth. I believe, according to the Word of God, people differ on this, but I believe that the church will be raptured out of this world. Those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, one of these days Jesus is going to part the eastern sky. We're going to see Him in His glory. 1 Thessalonians 4 says that the dead in Christ are going to rise up, and those of us who are alive and remain at the coming of Christ are going to be caught up in the clouds just behind them to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. But when that time comes, I, I genuinely believe that a seven-year period of tribulation is going to be unleashed on this earth. It's going to be a terrible time of horrific calamities on this earth. If you want to read more about that, read Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation 18. Terrible, horrible things that await this planet. Once the church, I believe, has been taken away from the earth. And in fact, I believe during the tribulation, according to 2 Thessalonians, that perhaps even the Holy Spirit's presence taken away from the earth during the tribulation. But then, at the end of that seven-year period of tribulation, the closest thing to hell on earth that this planet will have ever experienced, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, beginning at verse 11, that there's going to come one riding in on a white horse. Now let me give you a little Bible trivia here for a second. At the beginning of the tribulation, at the beginning of the tribulation with those initial seal judgments, the Bible says there's going to be somebody coming riding in on a white horse. Now who's the first rider on the white horse? At the beginning of the tribulation, i got a clue for you. It's not Jesus. It's the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to come rolling in 
persuasive, winsome, and he is going to bring the entire world into his strong delusion. And by the way, haven't I told you before that the devil has never had an original thought? The devil always takes the work of God and counterfeits it. So the devil is going to bring in a, a, a figure who's going to be like a messianic figure. And all the world's going to get caught up in the rebellion. He'll come riding in on a white horse at the beginning of the tribulation. But then at the end of that seven year period of time, Revelation 19 verse 11 says that there's, there's, there's going to come in another rider on a white horse. And this time it's not going to be the Antichrist. The Bible tells us who it is, by the way. It says his countenance will be like wool and his glory will be radiant. And the Bible says a sharp double-edged sword will protrude from his mouth. I think that's a symbolic picture in Revelation 19 about Jesus, about the Word of God, about the Word of God unleashed from his mouth. And the Bible says in Revelation 19 about verse 15 that with that sword, our Savior Jesus is going to strike the nations. And Jesus at the battle of Armageddon, you've heard that before, right? Revelation 16 talks about the battle of Armageddon. Jesus will lead the armies of heaven into battle. I think even us, the Lord Jesus, is going to lead us into battle at the end of the tribulation and at Armageddon. Jesus is going to win the battle over evil. And the Bible says when He has won that battle at Armageddon, that there will be a reign of 1,000 years with Jesus and us on this earth. That's called the millennial kingdom of our Savior Christ. That's the third aspect that we're talking about here tonight. Right now, I'm going to be flat honest with you. I'm discouraged about the leadership of kingdoms in this world. I'm talking about my own kingdom here. I'm talking about the United States of America. I'm frustrated. I'm hurt. I'm upset by things that I see happening. But I'm not going to allow Satan to steal my joy because my citizenship, as much as I love being an American, my true citizenship is in heaven and the kingdom I'm looking for is not the kingdom of the United States or of Great Britain or of Germany or anywhere else. The kingdom we are shooting for is the kingdom of our Savior Jesus Christ. And when we get to that kingdom, there won't be any rigged elections there won't be any funny business. There won't be any misjustice. Everything is going to be set right. When we reign with our Savior, Jesus Christ, that is the kingdom we are yearning for. In fact, I love this passage in Isaiah chapter 11. Scripture says in Isaiah 11, verse 6, this is talking about the millennial kingdom. You say, what's that going to be like when we're reigning with Christ on this earth? Well, read it for yourself in Isaiah 11. It's wonderful. Gave me hope today. Cheered me up. Bible says the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Those are enemies. But in the kingdom of God, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling shall dwell together. And the Bible says there, a little child shall lead them. You know what's so awesome? You get a little bit later down, I think it's verse 8 in Isaiah chapter 11. The Bible says that a child will put his hand and play in a viper's den, a viper's pit, and not be harmed. Because the scripture says, no more will they harm or will they hurt on my holy mountain. We have so much distress. We have so much disease. We have so much war. When we reign with Christ, all of that will be gone. You know, John Lennon, wasn't it John Lennon who several years ago wrote that song about imagine, imagine there's no war, imagine there's no conflict, all this stuff that we as human beings by our own ingenuity somehow can usher in. That, that's the real failure of socialism, by the way. As it says that we by our own ingenuity can, rush you, can usher in an age of utopia and peace. We can't do it by ourselves. We are not, I'm not the prince of peace. You aren't either. There's only one prince of peace and that's Jesus. And when he establishes his kingdom, then we will finally have a lasting peace. In the kingdom of our Savior Jesus Christ. 
And in case you wanted to know how that story ends, read Revelation chapter 20 because the Bible says after that 1,000 years is completed. I don't know how Satan's going to do it. I don't know exactly how it's going to look, but I know the Bible says at the end of that millennial kingdom that Satan is going to attempt to lead one final rebellion. And he's going to bring it all the way to the city of God in Jerusalem. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20, I think verse 9, Scripture says that fire is going to rain down from heaven and the enemies of God are are going to be consumed. And then I believe it's verse 10 says that our God, our Savior Christ, I believe at that moment, is going to make the devil kneel down at the feet of Jesus. What does the Bible say? Every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I believe that before Jesus throws the devil into hell forever... He will force him to kneel at his feet. And the devil will have to confess once for all, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's going to be cast into hell. And then, beloved, you've got two chapters of Scripture left after that. They're Revelation 21 and Revelation 22. You know what they talk about? The new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. And the Bible says in Revelation 21 verse 4, every tear shall be wiped from their eyes. (laughs) No more pain, no more suffering. All the former things are going to be done away with. Jesus himself will illuminate the heavens and we will be at perfect peace and rest with Christ our Savior forever. That is what we are looking forward to. We are looking forward to that with great anticipation the time when Jesus will lead us into battle at Armageddon, establish his kingdom, and then set off the events that will finally lead us into the new Jerusalem. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. I'm thrilled to be a citizen. I'm thrilled to be... I, every time I, I leave, which I don't travel outside this country very much, but in the moments and the times that I do travel outside this country, I'm always glad that my passport says citizen of the United States of America. I thank God for that. It breaks my heart to see things happening in our country right now because I'm proud to be an American. I thank God for it. But my citizenship and your citizenship is in heaven. That's the kingdom we're laboring for right now. Listen, the United States of America could, could go away someday. And very well, and it will at the end of time. And when that time comes, the kingdom of our Savior Jesus will continue forever. We labor for that kingdom. Amen.